Hello everyone and welcome to this week's episode of the Aftermath series. Let us waste no time at all and dive right into this week's episode of Critical Role. So we start off in the stormy streets of Rexingtrum as the party attempts to make their way to the temple to Pelor through the chaos that seems to be happening. There appears to be an assault on Rexingtrum by the Kryn dynasty as well as Oban and the rest of the cultists trying to make their way to the temple to break one of these shackles that chain Tharazdun. Now what makes this interesting for the party as they make their way towards this temple is that they're coming across the Crown's Guard of the Empire and also the Kryn operatives of the Kryn dynasty. It puts the party in a relatively awkward position because thus far the party has done a fairly good job at avoiding the direct conflict of the Empire and the Kryn dynasty. But now, Matt has sort of put them right in the middle of a war zone, and the party has some choices to make. Who do they ultimately side with? Now, the party did do a fairly good job at staying neutral in this. However, I guess you could lean more towards them siding with the Korean dynasty, because they just let the Crown's Guard die that they did come across. However, they were apprehended, so to speak, by one of these Korean operatives. But Ford quickly flashed the symbol of the Bright Queen and told them to leave them alone. Which they quickly did, however Pumat Sol, who has been traveling with the party, did notice Ford flash the symbol of the Bright Queen, so that may be a conversation that comes up later on. But after the party pushes through the chaotic streets, they finally reach the temple to Pelor, where they make a little crawl space to secretly infiltrate the interior. Within the temple, it is revealed that there are more than just the handful of cultists that we are aware of. We do see Respa as well as five or more other cultists seemingly attending a sermon held by Respa. And due to a locate creature spell by Caduceus Clay, it was discovered that Yasha and probably the rest of the group are underneath this temple. And so the party will have to battle through Respa and these cultists in order to reach their true destination. And so the party slowly crept their way into this temple. And then a battle began. A battle that lasted a majority of the episode, about three hours to be exact. And so I'll just briefly go over a few of the highlights of this episode. Caleb came in super clutch with, I believe he cast three separate fireballs that incinerated most of the cultists and did heavy damage to Respa. Nott eventually landed the killing blow onto Respa by pinning her to a pillar with a crossbow bolt through the neck. But she was also able to do this because of the guiding bolt spell that Jester had casted on Respa the turn before. And some of the imagery involved with this kill was the Traveler's hand helping aim Nott's crossbow towards Respa. I believe this is the first instance where the Traveler has made himself known to other members of the party. So we'll have to see if Nott brings us up to Jester after the entire battle is over. During the course of this fight, while Respa was still alive, she sounded the alarm, so to speak. And a few rounds later, Yasha, the Laughing Hand, Oban, and the Inevitable End made their appearance and joined the fight. And once again, due to a clutch stunning strike by Beauregard, and some massive damage from Caleb, the Laughing Hand was finally defeated. And with Yasha finally joining the fray at this point, the party is likely going to have mixed feelings about seeing her, since the last time any of the other members besides Jester saw her was back in the King's Cage, back when she initially betrayed them. But thankfully, through the chaos of this fight, Caduceus Clay was able to see this orange glowing symbol on the back of Yasha's neck that seems to be the symbol that holds Yasha to Oban. But before Caduceus was able to dispel this symbol, we had a powerful moment where Yasha almost killed Beauregard. She knocked her unconscious with one swift strike and then delivered two death saves as she was on the ground, unable to defend herself. But then moments later, Caduceus was able to cast a fifth level dispel on this symbol on the back of Yasha's neck, and the symbol was destroyed. Yasha once again regained control of herself, and storm clouds began to brew, 
and the stained glass windows in this church exploded as rain poured in, lightning striking across the sky. It seems like the storm that was outside has made its way into the interior of this church, symbolizing that the Storm Lord is once again reunited with Yasha. Yasha lets out a scream of rage as well as relief now that she has finally regained control of herself. And now with Yasha back on the side of the party and the Laughing Hand destroyed, Oban sees that the tides are turning in the party's favor, so he decides to make a run for it, but not before attempting to charm Not the Brave, which he is successful in doing and instructs Not to follow him down into the depths below. But Oban isn't the only issue that the party has to deal with. It seems that new abyssal rifts were planted within the church and endless hordes of abyssal monsters are coming forth and attacking the party. At about this point, Pumat Sol, who has been aiding the party in this fight, decides to transform himself into a larger, more hulked out version of himself, and he will now be known as Pumat Swole instead. Pumat instructs the party to pursue Oban while he fends off these abyssal creatures. And so, with Yasha reunited with the party, the party descends further into the cathedral after Nott and Oban and the Kato Geist, leaving Pumat behind to fend off the remaining abyssal creatures. Now, as the party moved on through the cathedral, they took some pretty hefty wounds in the fight upstairs, and so they took a 10-minute breather to sort of recuperate and regain some hit points. Now, I was at first really worried about this decision because we don't know what Oban has planned, and I was worried about Nott's well-being and if she may survive that long. But luckily, after the party rested, they continued into the crypts of the cathedral and had to figure out as they entered this chamber with a statue of Pelor where Oban went. There were, they were nowhere to be seen. And after some problem solving, they eventually found that there is a secret lever within one of the braziers next to this statue. And upon flipping this lever, a secret passageway was revealed. The party descended this hidden staircase and entered a chamber with an obelisk, a familiar obelisk, one that they've seen similarly in the King's Cage. Within this chamber, they also saw four circular runes on the ground, and Nott was indeed within one of them. But again, Oban and the Ketogeist were nowhere to be seen, and so the party prepared themselves by casting Bless on each of the members as well as Nott, and they dispelled the magical charm that seemed to be tying not to Oban. And so, the party entered this chamber, and another battle ensued. During this battle, it was once again realized that the inevitable end, or Juriel, may also be under this charm effect by Oban. So while the party was unable to dispel this, perhaps it's something that the party can do in the future. But as the battle continued, blows were dealt on both sides, both sides falling heavily wounded. I was worried for Yasha. I was worried that she might have a sort of PTSD with going against Oban. But it seems that the rage that Yasha is being fueled with and the strength that the Stormlord is now giving her is blocking out any fears she may have. And while the ritual to destroy one of the shackles that chain the chained oblivion was almost complete by Oban during this fight, it was Yasha who ultimately delivered the final blow that killed Oban. In Oban's last moments, he pleaded with the Chained Oblivion to give him a second chance, to give him the strength to defeat the Mighty Nine. But the Chained Oblivion only responded with how Oban is a failure and he would be punished. And so Oban's body liquefied into this black tar and these disgusting tendrils began to protrude from his new oily, slick body, and what was once Oban is now Oban the Punished. And that is where Matt decided to end the episode after, I believe this may be one of the longest episodes in recent times, but we ended it in the middle of a battle. Because it's obvious that this fight is not over yet, but I'm curious to see if, because Oban is now killed, is Juriel free of Oban's grip? And is Oban still willing 
to fight the party now that he's been shamed in such a way. I guess we're gonna have to wait and see, and we're gonna have to wait two weeks because the cast of Critical Role is of course taking next week off for Thanksgiving. But with all of that being said, we are going to wrap up. But before we fully conclude, as you can rightly tell, I am a huge fan of Critical Role, and so I decided to further show my support by purchasing one of these absolutely fantastic Critical Role t-shirts. The shirts are super high quality, incredibly comfortable, and the artwork is absolutely awesome. So if you'd like to show your support as well, and show off to your friends showing how incredible the Critical Role community is, you can pick up your very own Critical Role shirt today at shop.critroll.com or shop.critroll.co.uk if you're across the pond. I will leave both links down in the description below. And just as a side note, I'm not sponsored by Critical Role at all. I'm just trying to show my support and let you guys know how amazing these shirts are. As always, let me know all of your thoughts, feelings, and emotions down in the comments section below. I hope you all have an absolutely fantastic rest of your weekend and Thanksgiving next week, and I will see you all in the next one.